All right, with Super Tuesday under our belts, it looks more and more like this is going to be a rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. What I'm wondering in is, and probably many of you are wondering, what is the third party presence going to be like? A lot of voters out there interested in alternative candidates, given the high levels of dissatisfaction with both Trump and Biden. Here to discuss who else might be in the race and also give us his take on what happened on Super Tuesday is Matt Welch, editor-in-large at <laughs> Reason Magazine, where I also work, also hosts a great podcast called The Fifth Column. Matt, it's so great to have you back on Rising. Thank you very much for having me back. All right. Well, I want to ask you uh, a lot about RFK Jr. and the Libertarian Party, which I know you've been paying close attention to. But first, any general impressions from the Super Tuesday uh, results, takeaways that you would like to share with us? Just that it confirms what we've all kind of dreaded all along, <laughs> and there's no there's no magic bullet left. It's going to be these two guys until it's not, or in case it's not. But there isn't any kind of way to prevent this from happening. It's amazing that we're in this place where the two oldest and least popular candidates in the history <laughs> of running for president, uh, and that 70 percent of the country doesn't want to see this rematch. That it's happening, but it's happening, uh, and uh, for that, I blame all of us. <laughs> I mean. To what do you attribute uh, Trump's unpopularity? Because it does seem as though if the if the if the voters are thinking he's too, let's say, right wing, too MAGA, however you want to frame that, Nikki Haley was an alternative that was right there. That obviously, given the news that she dropped out of the race, was not garnering quite enough support. So, what do you think it is that con conservative voters are looking for in the alternative? I mean, I don't know if conservative voters are looking for the alternative. That's kind of the point, you know? Like, uh, Trump, when he was president, had as high an approval rating among Republicans as any president had. He just didn't have any among independents uh, or uh, Democrats. Uh, so he's a highly polarizing figure. The, there's this sort of cycle doom loop that the media or the anti-Trump crowd, and I'm in the media and I don't like Trump, so you could maybe classify me that way, where they get in, where they just add the high dudgeon of protest to someone who is, you know, high dudgeonable and protestable, um, and that makes him more attractive to his base. Uh, and uh, people haven't figured out how to uh, snap out of that loop, and they're not going to, judging by just looking around at, at how much wagon circling there has been already among some uh, people, media critics, Democratic operatives, of like saying, it's not true that Biden's too old. Um, that's all in your mind. It's the media. It's the New York Times making it up. So you can see that people are just not ready to face the truth. And the more that an establishment is out there telling people that what they are seeing is not happening, the more that they're going to gravitate to the anti-establishment candidate. And as weird as it is that someone that rich and that famous for so long and was the president is an anti-establishment candidate, that is the attraction. So people should be aware of that as they're battling him. Indeed. All right. So you have been reporting on Libertarian Party politics uh, for a while. There is this flirtation going on between RFK Jr. and the LP. Obviously, he declined to join the party at one point. Uh, my conversations with uh, LP chair Angela McArdle suggested to me that she, she would have at one point at least liked to have him as the nominee given his COVID stances. Of course, he has so many other differences with libertarians, um, frankly, even on some foreign policy Israel type stuff. He's really kind of been hawkish on that. So, so give, me, give me your view. Is this something people just keep saying could happen, but is actually not really realistically going to happen at all? I think that the people who are most enthusiastic about this uh, are not coming from the RFK camp, are not RFK, certainly not the strategists working for him trying to get him on the ballot in 50 states, which is kind of the whole attraction for the Libertarian Party because they're already on the ballot in 36 states. Um, the people who are uh, talking about this is Angela McArdle, the chair of the party, um, who is otherwise facing a definite decline in the number of states that the party will qualify on the ballot for, which is kind of a pie in the face. Um, uh, it's a little bit embarrassing. And other people who are kind of circling around, Ron Nielsen was quoted in the Peace in the Hill, which is a newspaper I'm sure you're aware of, um, <laughs> talking about how that uh, libertarians are, are potentially very interested in this. Well, Ron Nielsen was the Gary Johnson campaign manager a couple of times, and I'm sure he can imagine the super PAC being uh, used for this uh, uh, purposes. The thing about RFK and the Libertarian Party, he was invited to the California Libertarian Party 10 days ago um, to speak, along with Cornell West and some and Jill Stein. Uh, she couldn't make it. Uh, and they had a straw poll with the presidential candidates. 95 people voted. He got one vote. 
Um, mm. So I don't think this is happening. Um, and also, it doesn't really make a lot of sense from RFK's point of view, because facing that kind of potential uh, headache, and every single Libertarian Party convention is a headache for the people running, uh, is uh, that happens in, in late May. He's got to do a lot of ballot access work in the meantime. Uh, and it's not clear that um, the Libertarian Party are going to be better than he is at getting ballot access. Ballot access is a problem that you can solve with money. He has money. Mm. Well, that surprises me because we're dealing with something similar on the left where our, uh, Cornell West initially announced with the MPP party, later joined the Green Party, the rationale seeming to be in large part that the Green Party was better situated and better able to gain ballot access than he was on his own. He has much less money than even someone like yeah. RFK Jr. And I'm a little surprised to hear that you don't think that not just the money, but the sort of expertise in infrastructure isn't enough to maybe justify or make it seem uh, more likely or legitimate for RFK Jr. to choose the headache because the upside is really there. You, you don't think the Libertarian Party has enough uh, of a benefit for RFK Jr. because of his war chest? No, um, uh, it doesn't. I mean, because the thing that it would sell is ballot access in this case, in this transaction. Um, but it would also yoke him with a policy platform that has all kinds of things, which they've honed for more than 50 years, and it hasn't changed that much. I would commit him to any number of policies that most American politicians are unwilling to defend and in many cases even entertain. He would be um, brutalized on the floor of the Libertarian Party uh, convention um, uh, serially, and he already has been by many of, of the candidates running for office, um, all in, in favor, again, to solve a question that he has a pretty good opportunity at solving. He's already qualified officially in about three states unofficially in, in a few others. He started a, a political party to get around some of the ballot signature requirements. He's been doing impressive work with ballot access. And again, he has money. And the Libertarian Party does not, generally speaking, nor does the Green Party. Cornell West is, a, is his own uh, interesting, uh, frequently shambolic, always entertaining figure. Um, I don't know what, is, uh, what his thinking was. Um, certainly Jill Stein, who uh, has more connections with the Green Party, uh, running maybe uh, dissuaded him from from running. I don't anticipate uh, Colonel West getting on that many ballots, although he's already on at least two. Just, uh, I do know some uh, a lot about this, having interviewed them both on my show. Good. I think there was a lot of interest in the Green Party and Cornell West being on the Green Party line, but there did seem to be some issue that Cornell West had with uh, some influence that the Green Party wanted to have over how he ran his campaign that he disagreed with. But there's nothing like the ideological discrepancies between RFK Jr. and the Libertarian Party like there are between Cornell West and the Green Party, which makes it an interesting um, reality. Could you speak more to what the real big ideological gaps are there that would preclude RFK Jr. from being accepted by the Libertarian Party as is? Sure. I mean, he's a very hardcore environmental regulator. He is someone who's advocated for the corporate death penalty against not just companies, but think tanks um, who have accepted money from companies who have uh, not been interested in uh, pursuing a climate reform agenda. Uh, he's walked back a little bit from some of those things. But that's pretty aggressively anti-free speech uh, and, uh, and kind of anti-corporation. Uh, he's been against nuclear power, although, again, he's, I think, somewhat moderated that. Uh, libertarians tend to be uh, in favor of that. Uh, it just he has been well to the economic left of the Democratic Party for almost the entirety of his career, Libertarian Party, to the extent to which you can describe it in right-left terms, has been well to the economic right of the Republican Party for a really long time. So I just don't see that particularly mashing up. I think there's some vibes that match up, um, this sort of anti-establishment vibe that does certainly COVID policy and uh, his stance towards Ukraine, which is matches up pretty well with the stances of a lot of the other candidates who are currently running. But as Robbie was alluding to, his stance on Israel is a, is a deal breaker for many people. And just, you know, there aren't that many issues where there is any overlap. And in the other direction, he's been a big government progressive for most of his life. The Libertarian Party ain't that. Yeah. I think the question was if uh, he was evolving his thinking to be libertarian uh, enough to be acceptable. Obviously, I would say he has still a ways to go, although I do appreciate some of his opposition to COVID era mandates and some other things. Uh, we will see what effect he has in a in a thir three three man, three candidate race in the 2024 general. Uh, Matt Welch, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks.